our first session is on low rates, causes and consequences. And uh, I am delighted to introduce my distinguished colleague, Ellen Ray, who is uh, Lord Raj Bagri Professor of Economics at London Business School and a member of the French Macro Prudential Authority. We encourage you to submit your questions throughout the session using the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. You will need to enter your name and affiliation and they will be read out when asking the questions to our speakers. Without further ado, over to you, Hélène. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you everyone for joining. I'm delighted to take part in this year's summit on low rates. And I will try to bring to the debate a view of a macroeconomist uh, on uh, fluctuations in real rates and cause between and cause of low real rates. Now, everything I've got to say today should not be ascribed to the French Macroprudential Authority, and these are only my own views. This is the usual disclaimer um, applying here. So I'm going to um, give you what I think are macroeconomic forces uh, behind movements in real rates. And building on this analysis, I will be looking ahead and try to sketch with you uh, what is uh, awaiting us in the future regarding the movements in real rates. That's the menu. I'm first showing you here a picture that is quite familiar for many people because this is the picture that we usually see when we talk about the decline in real rates in the recent period. It starts in 1980, and here this is the US real rates at various maturities. And as we can see, there is a pretty impressive decline in the trend for these real rates. However, here is another picture that maybe is a little bit less familiar. If we go back in history, and here I'm started at the end of the 19th century and cover the 20th century and beginning of the 21st century, we can see that the recent evolution in real rate is actually not that remarkable maybe if we look at historical standards. There has been a lot of action before the 1980s in terms of uh, real rate movements. And it is likely that maybe we can actually learn from history, therefore, in order to understand what is happening to real rates today in the recent period. You can see here that the real rates of the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and France have shown quite a bit of common movement, just like they have in the recent period, also back in history. And there was quite a bit of volatility. Now, of course, I started in the 19th century. Some people who have done research have gone farther back. Schmelzing has put together some data on real rates going back to the 14th century. And you can see here as well that maybe there is a long term trend declining in real rates. Uh, however, of course, the structure of the economy is being so different. If we go back to the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, I'm not going to dare going back. So I will keep my analysis for today at the period which I think is very relevant for us, which is the period of the 20th century and beginning of the 21st century. So it's only the little bit which is on the right of the slide right now, uh, the last blue line. So what are the macroeconomic forces that determine movements in real rates? Well, in economics, real rate of interest are determined by the demand and supply of funds. So when we have periods of high savings and relatively weak investment demand, real rates tend to be low. And why could we be in, in such a period right now? Well, there are several explanations that uh, are being put forward. We can think about explanations which are based on structural trends. We can also think of explanations which are linked to financial cycles, and in particular, especially boom bust cycle, which is also something I will focus on today. And finally, of course, we have to ask ourselves, we are facing a massive shock currently 
the COVID-19 shock, and which effect does that have on the market for demand and supply of funds? So I'm going to look at those issues and try to give you my views. The structural trend explanation for low real rates. This is what is often called the secular stagnation view after this term was resurrected by Larry Summers in 2013, describing the kind of unusual economic situation, macroeconomic situation that we have been in for quite a few years. So what is behind the structural trend view of low real rates? Well, again there, there are quite a few deeply entrenched trends of the macroeconomy that we should consider. Some trends are linked to demographic factors. And here we are thinking about increase in life expectancy, decreasing birth rates in particular, which are two factors which may explain an increase in saving rate. Another important structural trend could be the decline in productivity growth, which would be a view put forward forcefully by Bob Gordon from Northwestern, where he would point out, well, actually, the type of innovation that we have seen in the recent period is nothing like steam engine or electricity. And therefore, the measured productivity growth is actually not that impressive. And the rate of growth of our economy is not that impressive. And that's another factor behind low real rate. Another possible explanation is the falling relative price of investment goods. More computers, which cost less, and relative to machinery and buildings, which are not a big share of investment goods any longer. So this could decrease investment demand and lower the rates. Increase in wealth inequality is also a clear possibility. And there, there is a team of researchers around the world, around the Paris School of Economics and around Berkeley, who have put together data, very interesting data on wealth inequality in many countries, and showing that, uh, in fact, there has been an increase in wealth inequalities in a number of places. This, again, might lead to a decrease in real rates via increased savings because rich people tend to have higher marginal propensity to save. But uh, this is not all. We have a last possible explanation which has been put forward, which is the global saving glass put forward by Ben Bernanke. Given the fact that uh, a big part of the world emerging markets are going fast and they tend not to have too many investment opportunities at home, they may ship their capital towards advanced economies in particular uh, towards the US market. Now, there's another view, which is the financial cycle view, which is the boom bust cycle view. And there, the story goes as follows. First, we may have seen, as in the 1990s and 2000s, excessive supply of funds due to financial deregulation, for example, due to expansionary monetary policy and exuberance in markets. Second, we've seen a financial crisis. And this financial crisis has led to a decrease in aggregate demand deleveraging. This could have been a source of decrease for the real rate. So, does secular stagnation mean low for long and boom bust mean up shortly? Well, I think it is not so simple. We have to ask ourselves how persistent are those trends and how transitory are those boom busts and vice versa, so of course. This means that really we have to be asking the data to speak louder. And how do we make the data speak louder? Well, in order to make the data speak louder, we have to speak a little bit in math. So let me walk you through this. I'm gonna start with a pretty non-controversial identity, which is the world budget constraint. 
So the wealth of the world at day t plus one is equal to the wealth, world wealth at day t minus consumption at day t multiplied by the return on wealth between t and t plus one. This is an, an accounting identity. So it has to hold. Manipulating it, we can rewrite it simply expressing an, an interesting concept here, which is the consumption wealth ratio. We can express it as a sum of expected future real risk free rates plus a sum of expected future risk premium minus a sum of expected future consumption growth. So again, I'm emphasizing that this is all an accounting identity, so I'm not making any assumptions here. It has to hold this equality linking the consumption wealth ratio to future expected returns and future consumption growth. Now the term and the sum are from date now, from date t, till um, the very long term future and they are discounted by a discount factor that depends on average values of the consumption wealth ratio. For those of you who are familiar with asset pricing, this is an equation which is very reminiscent of dividend price ratio expressed as a function of future returns and future dividend growth. So this object, the consumption wealth ratio, you see, can tell us something about, in particular, future real risk rates. So it's an interesting object, but we don't know if it does or not, or if it tells us something about future consumption growth or future risk premium. It depends on what the data is going to tell us. So that's what we're going to look at now. What does the consumption wealth ratio look at look like? Well, here it is. You see it for the US, you see it also for an aggregate of US, UK, France, Germany. And you see they are quite correlated. And something very interesting happens when you look at this data on consumption wealth ratio. You see that there are two periods in which it went down significantly. This is around the Great Depression and around the financial crisis of 2008. Okay, and in both cases, interestingly, these are times where there were talks of secular stagnation. The first period, it was Hansen who introduced the term, and the second period, it was Famers who took back that term. So now, the question is, what does the consumption wealth ratio with this behavior around the big financial crisis tell us possibly about future real rates? So here it is again, this time in logs. So don't make anything of a, of a scale here on the, on the, on the y-axis. I'm going to plot with the consumption wealth ratio, the sum of expected future real rates. And it's appearing here as a red line. And you see that if we plot the future real rates and the consumption wealth ratio, they seem to come move very closely. So this means that the consumption wealth ratio now at date T tells us something about future real rates. The, the movement is pretty striking. When the consumption wealth ratio goes down, future real rates seem to go down as well. Right? This is what we can uh, see from this graph. If I look at the two other terms of my decomposition, which are the risk premia and first the risk premia, which I add here in, uh, in black, you see that the link is not tight. So the consumption wealth ratio doesn't have much to say about future risk premia for long period. If I put future consumption growth, same thing, this is in green here, not a very tight link. So the consumption wealth ratio does not have that much information about future consumption growth. But it does have future information about, risk, about the, the, the real rates, the risk real, real rates. So this is what the data says. And again, I've, I've used only an accounting identity. I have not used any assumption here or anything. So the data has told me this. Consumption wealth ratio today tells me something about the movements in future real rates. Now, I'm going to add my own narrative to this finding coming from the data. And I'm going to say, let's look at a narrative that makes sense of the movements in consumption wealth ratios and the subsequent movements in real rates that are predicted by the consumption wealth ratio. And so here's my narrative. As you see here, in the 1920s, just like in 1990-2000, we see a sharp decline in the consumption wealth ratio. These are two periods where wealth 
grows faster than consumption. These are two periods where there was a lot of exuberance in financial markets. So wealth grows quickly, more quickly than consumption, and so the consumption rate ratio goes down. Both periods end with a big financial banking crisis. We have 1929 and we have 2008. After that big financial crisis, we see a period of deleveraging, weak aggregate demand, so low real rate, and the talk of secular stagnation comes in. This is where it first appeared with Hansen, and this is where it reappeared uh, with, in 2013 with Summers. So the pattern is pretty similar in both cases. We are talking about a boom, consumption wealth ratio going down because wealth goes up quickly, a big bust with the banking crisis, and then a period of deleveraging and weak aggregate demand, which leads to low real rates. This seems consistent with what we see in the data. Now, if this is the right narrative, we can also um, think about whether the current period is here for us to stay. Well, these boom busts are extremely persistent when they are based on financial crisis with banking crisis. We know we have studied them. There's a lot of propagation mechanisms and scaring effects in the macroeconomy if you have a big banking crisis. And these lead to periods of prolonged, weak aggregate demand. This seems to be what we have been seeing in the 30s and what we have been seeing after 2008. Now, we can go further and ask, OK, this consumption wealth ratio today, what does it tell us now about the future real rate, which is what we have done. And we have just used the information in the consumption wealth ratio to project the, the real rate, 10-year average future short, future, future short real rate between 2015 and 2025. OK, so what we see here is that this 10-year average future short real rate is low and will remain low. And on average, we find minus 3.1%. So it's lower for longer based on this, um, on this data on the consumption wealth ratio. Now, this is not even talking about COVID-19 and the COVID-19 shock. So can we expect that the COVID-19 shock is even more about lower for longer? Well, there are several reasons to think so. So one reason, which is an important one, is a big increase in uncertainty due to the pandemics, which leads to more precautionary savings. And especially if we have a phenomenon called the scarring of beliefs, meaning what, when people have experienced a catastrophic shock, they may be more likely to, ex to expect such a shock in the future, and this will increase their precautionary savings. We also have forced savings, especially from the upper part of the income wealth distribution because of lockdowns. So there's a lot of savings in some bank accounts and hopefully elsewhere. We have an aggregate demand decrease due to COVID-19, which is likely bigger than the supply shocks that we have been experiencing. So all these factors would put further pressure downwards on the real rate. However, we have to recognize that there are also some forces due to COVID-19 that could actually put upward pressure on the real rates. So one such possibility is some more unexpected supply shock pushing up inflation and therefore monetary policy response to this shock. That would push the real rate higher. We could also see, and that's a different perspective, a dive in inflation expectation not offset by a similar decrease in nominal interest rates, possibly because monetary policy becomes less effective at the ELB, at the effective lower bound. And if there was, would be a disanchoring of inflation expectation to a downside, that would also be a possible uh, lowering of a real rate, uh, increase in the real rate, sorry. Finally, we have the issue of a fiscal monetary nexus 
more debt, in particular, more public debt showing up in many balance sheets now, and the corresponding effect on savings, so total savings going down because of that, and possible effect on the risk premium. All that would put upward pressure on real rates. Now, it is hard to make the balance of these factors, uh, and data is a little bit hard to come by in order to answer the question based on past records, because fortunately, we didn't have that many pandemics. However, there has been some interesting attempt um, made by researchers going back to the 14th century and looking at all the pandemic episodes. And what they have found in these studies is that yes, after pandemics, the real rates tends to go down. And it tends to go down in a very persistent way, the peak being after 20 years, in a way which is relatively heterogeneous across countries, but which is long lasting. So it's a little bit bold to infer something from, from these uh, past reports because indeed the structure of the economies has changed a lot uh, over the centuries. However, this may be an indication that COVID-19 um, will put further pressure downwards on, on the real rate. Now, to conclude, I think based on this analysis of macroeconomic forces that I just put forward to you, that lower for longer is, is more likely than not. But it's not because of structural trends. In fact, I've put the spotlight on what I believe is more likely to be driving what we are seeing, which is the boom bust cycle trajectory rather than structural strengths in the economy. Doesn't mean that they are not there, but I think the dominant force seems to be linked to this boom bust cycle that I discussed. And also the COVID-19 shock seems to put further pressure to lower the real rates. So of course, this has a lot of consequences, including monetary policy consequences and how central banks deal with the effective lower bound, which is likely to be with us uh, for a while. But there are also some things that we should never uh, keep out of our sights, which is that even if we believe, like me, that it's lower for longer, there's still the possibility of risk of an abrupt increase in real rate, which has to be watched in a type of risk management view uh, very acutely, given the high level of debt that is on all the balance sheets. So these are my, my conclusions, and I, I hope uh, my analysis will help you think through these difficult issues. And now I would like to launch a couple of polls in order to have a feeling for what the audience is thinking around these issues. So let's start with poll number one. So for the audience, you should have a button on the right-hand side um, of your screen, the bottom right-hand side of your, of your screen, you should have a poll button that you can use in order to vote. And the question is whether in advanced economies, do you expect the short real interest rate in the coming two years to go down, to stay the same, or to go up? So that's the first questions we'd like you to answer. And we'll wait 30 seconds to leave you the, the time to vote, and then we'll have a second question. So uh, more or less, there is a close position between uh, the real rates will go down about 40% and stay the same 46% while the people think it will go up uh, are in a minority at about let's say 14%. So it seems like we are smaller or equal to is the dominant view for the real rate um, for the coming two years. Very good. And so now uh, to complement that question and in order to uh, maybe try to interpret it a little bit more, I would like to ask a second question. So that's gonna be poll number two, same process for you to answer. And the question of poll number two is in advanced economies, do you think inflationary expectations in the coming two years will go down, will stay the same or will go up? 
it looks like most people or a majority of people expect that inflation expectation will actually go up uh, in the next two years. So this is uh, a quite interesting set of results, I would say. So first of all, uh, I would note that uh, people tend to believe maybe along the stories that I, I was discussing before, or maybe uh, indeed for other reasons that the real rates is likely to either go down or stay the same. Uh, but if we look at the second uh, poll, so with people in majority expecting inflation rates to go up, so that would tend Keteris uh, paribus to lower the real rates. So this is consistent with uh, the first poll, the first question. Now, however, for people who expect, and there was quite a few, uh, who expect the real rate to stay, to stay the same, if inflation expectations tend to go up, that would mean that nominal rates will also uh, tend to go up, which is uh, more of an interesting maybe uh, finding because that would suggest that there is or there are a number of people in the audience who think that in the coming two years, central banks possibly uh, are going to be uh, tightening a bit. Uh, and therefore, if the nominal rate goes up, inflation expectations go up, that would mean the real, the real rate of interest would stay approximately the same. So this is, uh, this is an interesting view because uh, it's not so clear uh, to me at least, that uh, we are going to be exiting the, the uh, ELB, the effective lower bound uh, on, on nominal rates uh, anytime, anytime soon. So I think this is a, a very, there's a lot of food for thoughts in this. Um, and uh, there are obviously all kinds of combina combinations between uh, nominal rates and, uh, and expected inflation that can give you movements in real rates. But I think uh, we have been identifying in the audience that inflation expectations are one of the most powerful channels here uh, for, for the people who are with us uh, today, which uh, I, I found I, I didn't know exactly what to expect from, from, from the uh, answers. And uh, I found that very interesting. Uh, over to you, uh, Anna. Thank you, Hélène, for a very insightful discussion. We have received many interesting questions from the audience, and let me get to them. So the first question is by Oysten Stephenson from the SEB. How can cent uh, have we become addicted to QE? How can central banks return to a more normal situation? So I'm, I'm not sure we can say we are addicted to QE. I think uh, when... Um, the macroeconomic fundamentals are the ones I described, uh, which uh, you know, are believe are uh, indicative of uh, uh, long run declines in uh, real rates and in uh, natural rates of interest. Well, this unavoidably means with inflation targets, which are around 2%, this unavoidably means that the central banks have to resort uh, not only to their usual short term uh, interest rate as an instrument, but also to uh, very much to balance to their balance sheets uh, in order to be able to stimulate the economy. So I really don't see it as, a, as, as an addiction. I see it as a, as a necessary reaction and rational reaction of central banks to the macroeconomic fundamentals uh, that I have described uh, during my presentations. And based on the persistency of these fundamentals, which I've tried to outline, including the boom bust cycle uh, persistent uh, effect. Uh, I think uh, we should not, uh, you know, seek um, to exit from this uh, type of policy anytime soon in order to support uh, macroeconomic activity, which is uh, number one uh, priority right now. Okay, thank you. Franklin Gonsalves from C6 Bank is asking, so the GDP of China is now greater than the GDPs of Japan, Germany, UK, and France combined. Is the rapid emergence of the Chinese economy an important factor affecting global interest rates? If yes, how to identify and model this factor? So um, I think there's no consensus so far in, uh, among macroeconomists about the exact role of the emergence of China on movements in the real rates 
and uh, and in particular uh, on, uh, on 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 inflation on the dynamics of global inflation so we can see that uh, clearly there is a force uh, which is uh, telling you that integration of the Chinese economy in the global economy has led to uh, wage moderation, price moderation, and has contributed to a muted inflation dynamics. Uh, I think definitely there is a force uh, which is there. Uh, what is extremely difficult to do in Dangor, of course, is how big this effect is compared to other effects that have been also important for inflation dynamics. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think we have a consensus yet, uh, but uh, we can see that there are these various channels playing from the, the wage moderation, the, the price uh, side of things, to uh, the growth of uh, savings in the world economy, which was most evident at the time where uh, Ben Bernanke talked about the global savings flat. And now, of course, we have a little bit of a different uh, dynamics, potentially, uh, in terms of uh, surpluses, which have been external surpluses, which have been again um, changed because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemics and the lack of synchronization between the, the Chinese economy and, and some, some other uh, economies. So I think, uh, you know, there is something there. It's probably quite important, but I don't know yet of any macroeconomic model that is able to give us a precise quantitative um, prediction on this. All right, and uh, so we're running out of time, but let me get one more question through. I have grouped a number of questions together, and um, a number of people are asking about a possible increase in rates and how destabilizing that could be, given that we entered uh, the COVID crisis already with a large debt, both public and private, and should rates then, now we have even more debt, and should rates go up, is this, would the situation be sustainable? So, so first of all, let me reemphasize that um, what I said in, 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 my, uh, in my talk was it is likely that we are rates will remain low. Okay? And, and, and that's, I think that's an important point um, for, for this discussion. Uh, however, as a risk management perspective, it's also uh, always important to think about what could happen if we had a uh, an unexpected shot, or one of these uh, factors materializing that I, that I discussed before. So the first thing I think to emphasize is that from a central bank point of view, uh, even with a big balance sheet, it is totally possible to uh, increase rate and effectively take losses on the asset side of the balance sheet of a central bank without running into, into trouble, because central banks can have a negative net worth. This is something that we have seen in the past. And this is something that we can, that, that central banks can do uh, without having any destabilizing effect on, on the economy um, to a large extent. So I'm not saying in any circumstances is some, something that, uh, or to any extent, this is something central banks can do, but there is a long, uh, there is a lot of space here. So uh, raising the interest rate would not uh, put central banks uh, stability in, uh, in Geopardy. Now, of course, there's a lot of other balance sheets besides uh, central bank's uh, balance sheet that we, have to, uh, that we would have to, uh, to worry about. And um, we, there we really, I think, for the, uh, for the long run effects on the economy, we really have to hope that uh, there will be enough of a period where R minus G negative, like it was in the post-World War period, uh, in order to to let us deal with the large amount of debt uh, that we're accumulating for them to go down, like we have done with the World War II debt, which has benefited from uh, you know, uh, post-World War R minus G being negative uh, to get down to much more uh, normal level. We, we, have to, we have to hope for that. So we have to hope that any increasing interest rate would be reasonably transitory, in which case, of course, we can, we can deal with that. Um, most likely, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity there across countries, depending on the maturity structure, et cetera, but uh, we can deal with temporary shock. All right. Um, so one, let me ask you one more question from Mohamed El Arian. In your prior work, Professor Ray, you looked into the issue of the common global factor. Can you speak to how the low for long paradigm in advanced countries relates to this construct including the computational issue, uh, the, oh, sorry, the compositional issues. 
particularly advanced versus developing countries. Thank you. Uh, so, um, thank you very much, Mohamed. Hi. <laughs> so, uh, as, uh, as as you can, uh, I mean, as you can, as you can tell, indeed, in my uh, in my previous work, I've emphasized uh, something which is um, a bit different from the uh, these uh, common movements in real rate that uh, I showed you today, uh, which are actually uh, quite interested, and the common movement in consumption wealth ratios, I think, are, are quite striking uh, across countries. But what I what I have mostly emphasized in previous work is the common component in risky asset prices and in risk premia across a very broad cross-section of countries. And in particular, what I, I could show is that there was a causal effect of US monetary policy on this uh, global common component uh, in asset prices. So there, um, it's not to say that there are not idiosyncratic effects, of course, across a few countries, et cetera, but uh, there's quite a, a lot of a variation in uh, risky asset prices movements, which is explained by a common component, and this common component is related to uh, US monetary policy. So that means that uh, we are uh, still likely to see uh, such a common co-movement, I think, for quite a few years, unless we expect that, for some reason, uh, the dominance of uh, US monetary policy, and that means the dominance of the dollar in international markets, is going down significantly, in particular in the banking sector, in particular in the financial market liquidity, in foreign exchange market, etc. So I think it's a bit unlikely that we're going to see uh, a decline in the role of the dollar in uh, the coming years. So I, I, therefore, I would expect that this global common component is going to stay with us. Uh, still for a while. Uh, however, I would be very interested to see what people say today about the disruption in the treasury markets, for example, the dash for cash that we have seen, and also maybe about the, uh, the very unusual behavior between the euro and the dollar exchange rate that we have seen uh, in, the, in this current crisis, in this COVID crisis, where unlike in 2008, uh, we have seen the euro mildly appreciating against the dollar. Uh, while in general, when there's a crisis, we have massive flight to safety uh, into the dollar, which is the, the global safe asset. So I'm very interested in these little jitters, maybe, uh, which we see in international markets, which could signal potentially a little bit of a decrease in the, in the role of the dollar, and therefore maybe a little bit of a decrease in, the, in my global factor. But still remain to be seen, I would say. <laughs> 